Thank you. I just hit got it. Hi, everybody. My name is Anita Cunningham. I'm the program director for the Robinson County Cooperative for Sustainable Development, as well as the project man manager for the North Carolina State Survival and Residency School. Um, I did want to just say a little bit um, about the State Survival School, but first, I think the, most of our staff already introduced themselves, but I did want to give an opportunity for uh, Steve Marson, who is our researcher, to introduce himself, and Matt Gladgerton, if he has not done so. Steve, you're muted. Okay. Hi there, is it working? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Marson. I'm a professor emeritus at uh, from UNC Pembroke, and I'm the senior researcher with the uh, Robinson County uh, Cooperative. Uh, Mac and I have spent many hours pulling together a review of literature. We're astounded at what we're finding. Um, uh, it appears as if North Carolina is a little bit behind other locales in terms of um, the issue of social justice in uh, disasters. Um, our re review of the literature is turning up uh, some interesting things. Even there even seems to be journals that focus on that one particular area, which is something that we were not expecting to find. Um, so that's what I've been doing. How's that? Thank you, Steve. Thank I'm, you. I'm Reverend Mac Ledgerton. I'm co-director co with Sally McLean uh, with our Robinson County Cooperative for Sustainable Development. Great. Okay. Thank you both. Um, after the presentation, we will open it up for a meeting uh, for questions, dialogues, and any comments that you may have. Um, so just a little bit about the North Carolina Disaster Survival School. It is a statewide school, and uh, the, it's an online vessel that we use to, um, to provide a vehicle for the communities to join together to assess like what's happening, support each other, learn from each other, and to combat some of the effects that we have around isolation as a result of the pandemic and organize um, creatively around collective action and systems change. Um, some of the topics and areas that we cover include um, political advocacy, um, the uh, virtual ac accessibility, which we know has been very important with the pandemic, medical awareness, community organizing. Um, and so uh, we do have a uh, online portal. I will drop the website into the chat. Feel free to uh, take a look at the work that we are doing. And if you are interested in providing any content information, if you have some resources, please, there's a link within the website where you can provide information as it relates to um, the survival school. If you want to do training, if you have some skills there as a, as a as doing post-production or any of that, um, and, and I will get those responses. So um, the, uh, we do have a presentation. I'm going to, can I share my screen, Andy? Okay, I have that. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we do have a, a, small, a presentation. Shouldn't take any more than 15 minutes. And our staff is going to help me facilitate this presentation. Let's see. I think this is it. Okay. Um, I just have to go to. Wait a minute. Hold on. One second. I have to go to the. Um, the slide view. I want to do the slideshow. Slideshow. Uh, oh, view. Okay, here we go. Uh, is it slide view? Is that the view? Okay, that's it. Great. All right, and we will start our presentation. Thank you for being patient. All right, so I think that 
uh, we have our staff person who's gonna be talking about this. Who is that? Uh, it's Anna? me. Yes, thank you, thank okay. you mm -hmm. for introducing that, sharing so much about the state school and helping us facilitate this presentation today. Um, as Ms. Anita already said, that we are the Robinson County um, Cooperative for Sustainable Development. We are um, getting our Robinson County so Disaster Survival disaster survival and resiliency school say that five times fast together and our mission is for our cooperative to build a multi-racial base of organized influence to achieve disaster environmental energy climate economic and social justice within robinson county and eastern north carolina um as the slide shows well as the previous slide shows, sorry, um, that Robinson County is very multi-racially diverse. We don't have a necessarily a majority racial group, although we have a high percentage of the indigenous population, um, Robinson County being one of the main territories that the Lumbee Native Tribe uh, corresponds and has jurisdiction over. Um, the slide previous right now. Next slide, thank you. This is an overview of what the Lumber River looks like. Um, and as you see, it has many canals. There's over 50 swamps in this area, as well as um, over 8,000 connections to the Carolina Bays. And what's so unique about this area is that the geographic and ecological um, growth in areas in this area is very, like, it's very unique and you cannot find this anywhere else, especially home of our cypress trees along North Carolina's coast. Um, so as you see, like I said, you'll see pictures of the Lumber River and also the canal ways. Next slide, please. So as we've talked about the major hurricanes that we have experienced within these last few years, seriously. Here in Robinson County, Matthew and Florence have been two of the 1,000 year old uh, floods. You're talking about um, rain falls as big as in Matthew, 20 inches of rain. And in Florence, there was 30 inches of rain that which really decimated this whole area and kind of trapped us in a sense uh, with limited resources. So it's how do we prepare? Cause we've already mentioned this before when the hurricanes start again, how do we prepare for another one to come? Next slide. Yes, yeah, so um, we spent two years designing the Disaster Survival and Resiliency School, um, and its mission is to engage community residents impacted by climate disasters uh, to facilitate an empowerment process so our impacted residents are leaders and equal partners in revisioning and redeveloping their impacted communities. So the goal is to utilize disaster community organizing uh, to facilitate the empowerment and so that our disaster impacted residents really own the process and become equal decision makers in that process, which is actually not the way the present system in North Carolina works. Our anticipated outcome is to really help restructure the disaster response system so that residents are empowered and become the designers and directors of every step and stage of the disaster response system in partnership with both the public and the private agencies. Next slide. So um, the survival school, we started it virtually in 2021 last year. We're working in the Lumberton and Red Springs areas. We have our first face-to-face -face meeting on June the 7th in the impacted areas of South and West Lumberton that were most impacted. Um, the way our system works now is that our impacted communities are really uh, treated as individual clients rather than as, and as recipients, rather than benefactors and givers. And we really want to, in Robinson County at least, and be a model to organize impacted residents to really become leaders and, and, and self-determine the new vision and new development of their communities. We really envision streets that are filled with uh, private energy efficient homes with passive and active solar energy with elevated driveways so that residents can actually get out of their cars or vehicles 
at their doors rather than having to go up ramps or stairs as presently is the case. And we really want to minimize government buyouts because none of our people want to live beside an empty lot, typically called a green space or an abandoned home. So we really are gonna concentrate a lot on the housing challenges in our communities. Uh, next slide. Um, so the organizing unit that brings disaster impacted communities to the table um, as equal partners, uh, that takes charge of their community disaster resources. <clears throat> the major strategies is to, uh, extensive and sustained door-to-door uh, -door community outreach. And uh, we are going to hold weekly meetings, highly participatory, so that uh, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. and uh, to uh, provide education and training uh, of a step-by-step -step approach uh, to uh, help uh, to, to be effective, you know, su successful community organizations and response in all four phases. So we also identify and train street leaders on every street and road so that they can go in and uh, do with their folk what they need to do to get them organized and uh, on point. And also to, the, uh, to extensive property to property surveying of res residents, uh, their information, you know, whether they own the property or rent it, or uh, to stage of uh, recovery and resiliency. Um, okay, uh, what what is the community based just disaster next recovery? Next slide, uh, Anita. Oh, I'm going next. I'm sorry. Next slide. Okay, so what what is community based just the, the disaster recovery? That's building capacity for residents to organize and lead their own recovery efforts. Um, so many times we don't get the, get the opportunity to be at the table ourselves and have our voices heard during the times of decision-making. We need to step up, come together and be at the table. So this ensures that our voices of our members are heard in the public discourse and uh, to mobilize funds and deliver mutual aid and coordinating legal support to undeserved communities and organizing people into positions of collective political power. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> Anita, that's yours. Hi, okay, sorry. So um, disaster and environmental justice, um, First off, for climate and environmental disasters are unnatural, political, and preventable. So as we know that um, some communities, um, and it seems the same communities are disproportionately impacted by the disasters um, and overburdened with a lot of environmental and public health issues, um, the path to just justice and environmental justice, the disaster justice and environmental justice are very similar. We're talking about relationships of organized influence as we talk about the organizing that we're doing in the communities, empowering residents to redesign and redevelop and be the leaders and, and the designers um, and the visionaries of the communities that they live in. Um, removing barriers as it relates to um, the protections in, in terms of public health, um, minimizing harmful emitters, whether it's, um, you know, organizations and, and, and companies that come in that um, continue to pollute our communities, um, as well as community-led and disaster, just disaster recovery approaches, um, which is on the ground organizing with multi-issue, uh, around multi-issue statewide. We're very, you know, as a, as, as a sort of a spinoff from the North Carolina Statewide Disaster Survival School, we are, we are addressing it at the state level. And so with the Robinson County, we're addressing it at the county level. And this is just the start for Robinson County. We're hoping to go to other counties as well um, and do national organizing and systems change at the local, national, uh, statewide, and national level. Because I think uh, we know that that's really where change occurs. Uh, one second. Okay, so the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the disaster system for them has four phases, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. Um, as we look at the model and it's related to disasters, um, this is 
uh, economic recovery for businesses after disaster in each phase of it, which requires um, distinct um, tools and, and strategies and resources to face the different challenges, not just with each disaster, but the different challenges in each community, because we know those are different as well. So the U.S. Disaster System Financing and Planning. So financing for disasters is managed um, by the state government with federal funding. It's implemented through the city, the county, um, the local city and county governments um, with assistance from non-governmental groups as well as governmental groups doing contract work. The planning is directed on the local level by the county and city emergency management teams. And part, part of uh, what we believe is that some of this management needs to come from the communities that are directly impacted by it. They're the ones that know uh, what's going on. They've been in these communities for, for generations and generations, and they know what they would like to see as it relates to things that are happening within their community. And often we're not at the table. Um, the system elements, which it lists here, is um, uh, individual and client-based, as we said, sort of as an individual uh, addressing individually as opposed to collectively as a community. And that's uh, what we're hoping to accomplish with the work that we're doing um, in our community and, and across the others. Uh, I think Meredith's having some technical issues. So, Mac, if you wanted to take over 12 and 13 for her. Okay, well, this is actually a quote uh, from, from me, and I'm just going to uh, just read the first, the first uh, part of this slide. Um, disaster community organizing is the process of organizing and empowering our most disaster-impacted residents and communities as equal partners and co-leaders in the four phases of the disaster response process and system that we've sort of re reframed. We call the whole system a disaster response system and not the second phase, which we actually have changed the words from disaster response to relief. So we see the four phases as being disaster preparedness, relief, recovery, and then the fourth phase of resiliency. Uh, next slide. Anita? Yes. So one of the major differences is we really make a distinction between an agency-based approach to disaster and a community-based approach. Even though agencies are in our communities, they really uh, function as agencies and relate to people on an individual client basis. One of the criticisms of this individual client-based system is it treats every person, whether you're a homeowner and a renter, as if you're on an island and to yourself and not a part of a larger community. In social work, we would call the difference, the difference between an individual client base and the community as client. And our present disaster system in North Carolina really doesn't recognize community as a resource and source, uh, a united community as being an equitable and equal partner in the disaster response system. So with a community-based approach, um, we, we started meeting weekly, virtually, and it was really hard for a lot of people to, to get online. So we're now starting to meet in person. We will eventually meet every week, but we're starting with the COVID continuance to meet on a monthly basis with masks and really working with our, our impacted community residents to help revision and redesign their community in partnership with the public and private agencies, improve communications, improve the focus on the meeting the housing challenges that remain. 40% of the homes in West and South Lumberton are now uh, in disrepair. And uh, there's many, many housing challenges as all of you know. Uh, the next slide. And I think we're back to Sally on the next slide. Let me get off mute. Um, yes, uh, this is the phase one of the community-based disaster pr preparation uh, part. Uh, 
the, the first thing we were to do is to hold weekly uh, community meetings uh, during the hurricane season <clears throat> and to form an uh, advocacy team to, to provide training uh, that will provide advocacy assistance to anyone, people that might need uh, things, you know, uh, need training in certain areas. And uh, to also form a free conference call number for each neighborhood so they can hold daily conversations, conference calls, uh, and to access a free, um, that number would be free to each neighborhood. And to review uh, supplies needed uh, to weather the storm, uh, also to make a list where every person and family plans to go if forced to uh, evacuate. A lot of times uh, storms happen and you don't know where you're going. So you need to have that in place and where you're going and all that so we can stay in touch. And um, I have the county and uh, our city emergency uh, staff to attend the neighborhood meetings so uh, they can review the emergency plans and services. <clears throat> and also to train residents, <clears throat> excuse me, on how to muck and gut their homes and remove mud, uh, mold, <clears throat> uh, just, um, and to get uh, supplies in order to do that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, phase two is, is the relief uh, phase. And it begins from the time a disaster hits the impacted communities uh, and until they're able to move back into their homes. So you continue to hold those uh, community conference calls every day and when the residents return to their homes, they have a face-to-face -face street meeting and street leadership meetings in the, in the neighborhoods. And if you're in a shelter, you can uh, hold the meetings there um, and uh, until you plan to return home when possible. And make sure that the residents uh, that need medical assistance, uh, like uh, food, clothing, medical care, prescription drugs, and that sort of thing, uh, they have the community advocacy uh, person or team to be in contact with them so that they can get the needed supplies. And when able, start a neighborhood uh, house by house muck and gut and mold removal program. And don't wait to the last minute to do that because the mold uh, uh, can grow. And as we know, mold is not good uh, for you. So don't wait weeks or months to make it happen. Just make it happen. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So you've heard about the uh, you've heard about the um, the first two phases, um, preparedness and relief. This is the recovery phase, and the recovery phase starts once folks get back into their homes or get to a place where they're going to be until they can get back into their homes, if that's temporary housing. Um, and this is where they have access to adequate shelter, whether it's um, you know, a hotel or a mobile or wherever they are, or back in their homes, food, any repairs that may be needed uh, that have to be addressed because of the, uh, the impact to uh, the disaster, whatever that is, um, and, and any other resources that may need a testing of home or air or replacement of belongings. And, and then you deal with physical, psychological, um, and the spiritual traumas that folks have experienced. Um, and, and connections, you know, at this point, you're going to be making certainly with um, government and claims as it relates to, you know, the losses that you just experienced. So that's the recovery. That is the recovery phase. Um, and then the resiliency phase is, um, and resiliency simply means uh, that community residents are impacted in leading, redesigning, and revisioning of their communities. Um, and it's not only to become at a level of where, of a level or quality of life that they have, but I like to think of resiliency as bouncing forward when we think about that we're trying to be um, safe, we're trying to be safe, be healthy, and be relatively content and happy with our surroundings, our quality of life, and where we are. And it not only improves individuals and families, but it also improves communities 
and institutions that need to help them and systems that manage these, um, which is why the work that we're doing around systems change is so very important in relation to all of these processes. After we survived and recovered, we thrived. So um, I think Meredith was gonna be with us, but parts of Lumberton have really bad uh, web service. So she's challenged to join us today. Um, we really worked a lot on how to improve the housing when our houses are elevated or totally reconstructed. Um, we really need to elevate the driveways as well and the churches don't do this. And, and so many seniors have to walk up five feet of ramps in Lumberton for the houses that are elevated or, or stairs. It would be very easy to elevate the driveways, leaving room for the water, uh, future floodwaters to travel underneath the driveway and to use passive and active solar on the homes, particularly uh, and on the south side uh, for passive solar and really, um, reconstruct the energy management of our homes, as well as to bring, uh, you know, even consider microgrids in our impacted communities. There's a lot of farmland right next to South and West Lumberton where we could put microgrids. If, if our middle-class families can have microgrids, why can't our low-income communities as well? Uh, create community gardens and green spaces, but really try to minimize the buyouts uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute, and really develop energy resilient homes so people will really want to move back in the communities um, and to really have a community that's thriving uh, with neighbors on each side of your home rather than abandoned home or green spaces. Next slide. We're I, know coming down to some, I know you've got some state proposals too that you wanted to get to, and I'm also seeing some folks in the chat start to get excited for a discussion. So just naming, we've probably got about 10-ish minutes left in this chunk of the agenda. Well, we'll we're, we're down to the end of this. Uh, Thanks, Andy. I, I thought we'd have a little more time for discussion. Um, I really, these are just some of the uh, trainings where we'll be providing online so everyone in the state could participate. I don't really need to go through these, but we're really finding that disaster housing challenges and solutions are really a key. Um, those of you on the call, Legal Aid has a new program, but we really have major challenges with, with housing repair, housing reconstruction, uh, the, the problem with heirs, and, and all of the challenges uh, with the housing issues in our impacted communities. Uh, the last slides, uh, Anita, and I won't go through all of these, are, are some of our recommended systems change uh, recommendations. The first you've heard over and over again from us is to really involve nonprofit organizations that are grassroots organizations in the community that use community organizing, participatory decision-making and advocacy, as well as to establish a special fund to provide financial support for the grassroots organizational partners. Um, also, you know, and we don't mean more individual case management programs. We really, really need community-based efforts that treat the community as a whole and the community comes together to be an active partner in this process. We also need an integrated case management system in every county. The state has the technology to do that now, but the, the critical qualitative question is why is the disaster response system empowering for agencies, but totally disempowering for residents? And, um, in community development, we use MOUs and MOAs all the time. So there should just be one application process, no matter what agency you go to. And we feel that no money should come to any county, federal or state or private monies until there's an integrated case management system. We also need a lot more legal assistance. It would help keep our homes. It would add to the tax base, but we need major, major work on legal assistance with all the forms to hold the, uh, the FEMA assessors accountable to make sure they give us the same rate they do other communities. And uh, next slide, there's a few more of these and I'll just briefly popcorn them. Um, really, we've got to build the community capacity to muck and gut 
and remediate mold. It is terrible that we rely on volunteer groups uh, that we're dependent on. And half the time, it may be three or four months before they get you on the waiting list. We really need to build community capacity to take care of our communities ourselves uh, with outside help, but not wait on them and be dependent on them. We also need to really halt the local buyout programs until disaster impacted residents are directly engaged in decision making. Otherwise, these buyouts are involuntary sellout programs because the people see no future for their communities because they're not involved in planning it, visioning it, or developing. Also, we really need housing expert and lawyers to be on the ground and on staff of all of our uh, community-based organizations to really address these housing challenges in our communities have been going on for uh, five years now, six years. And lastly, we really need a countywide flood mitigation plan. Uh, if one town does it, the water will flow downstream and then back up. We've got 50 swamps in Robinson County. There's going to be major work on 95, a gate put up, but there's been no real serious discussion with impacted residents of what this is going to mean, how it will help, and what the result is going to be countywide. And I believe that closes out our uh, our session. And I think, uh, Hannah, you were going to open it up for discussion. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to say a major thank you for listening to our presentation or in my name, native language, Nawe. And we open up the floor for any discussion, any questions, or anything in the presentation that you're just really excited about. So please share your thoughts. And Andy, if you'll facilitate what, what we have left, that'd be great. Gladly. Um, I know there was some excitement and- um, Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anita. Um, uh, I know there was some excitement and Larissa, I know you have to step off soon, but I didn't know if you wanted to share a little bit more, Noah also, but I also know there are some folks here because this is a collaborative space who are involved in a lot of the programs. And so wanted to create that space for dialogue about what this kind of vision looks like. So um, in my previous position, I worked a lot on disasters um, and we had a similar approach. I think that I'm just really excited about this project. I already signed up for the updates online because <laughs> I think it's very promising. Um, for us, um, I would say that the main challenge that we have had was working with undocumented families. Um, and I'm definitely a resource if you ever wanted to chat about that, or if you actually have a plan on how to include um, undocumented families into your program, I'd love to hear about it. Question and before you answer, I was gonna, um, Add on to that, um, that, you know, if, if I'm interested in learning more, especially how you all are involving like non-English speakers um, in my situation, like particularly like Spanish speakers, um, but also wanted to offer um, that I would like to participate in any way I can and use my role um, to connect if needed. Hannah, um, there's a question in there, which is, you know, how are you all thinking about working with folks who are undocumented and also folks who use languages other than English? Um, which is a great question, um, because we definitely want to see this as multiracial uh, as an organization. And that is a, a barrier that we're trying to currently overcome. Um, uh, Miss Anita Mack, you're more than welcome to add on to this. But like I said, this is a barrier that we're trying to overcome because we don't want anyone, not one group, to feel left out of. I think that as we um, as we partner with groups and as we coordinate uh, resources, I think this is a perfect opportunity to build some alliances because we do have challenges and. When we come on and kind of share with you the work that we're doing, we're very interested in trying to reach everyone. And we know that there are non-Spanish speaking people in our communities. So I'm very excited, Jocelyn. I will definitely get in contact with you. Um, I will leave my name and my number and my email in the chat. 
Um, I will report we've been very successful raising monies. And so we are going to hire a Spanish speaking person. Uh, there's five of us working part time now. And eventually, uh, as well as Steve is helping us with some of the ongoing research. Uh, so we anticipate to have a Spanish speaking person in our collective, uh, hopefully by Ju July, if not by August. But uh, we have a very large Spanish speaking population in Robinson County as throughout the Eastern part of the state. So we're pleased that we're able to raise the funds to, we have the three major races involved and now we'll be also including our Spanish speaking neighbors. Hearing sort of two approaches. One is making sure that there's that kind of asset of being a Spanish speaker on staff. Also an opportunity to build alliances and partnerships with others who have those connections already. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a Latinx association in our rural counties. And as y'all know, many of our rural counties in the East, uh, uh, we work closely with the Mexicom, um, and Nita is our, our liaison with the Mexicom, but uh, a lot of these rural counties are really underserved uh, in the Latinx community. Theresa sharing in the chat some of the resources that the Episcopal Farm Workers Ministries developed. Um, and I, I would, I'm sorry, I just want to say like I would reach out to them because they've been working on disaster stuff with undocumented families since 2018. And um, I'm going to share some of the materials on the chat, but, and they don't work in, I think you guys are in Robertson, correct? And, and yes. they don't work all that far, but they, they did make it like all the way to Pender County and stuff. So you might want to just at least um, share uh, some of the information because they, they have like a way to work with a community that has worked and has been effective for all these years. Thank you. Anita, could you put the uh, Google Doc in the chat that has the slide presentation? I'll make sure that PDF also gets in there too. But Kelly wanted to jump in. Hi, thank you. Um, hi, Mac. I've been looking forward to this presentation. Um, I thought this was a commendable idea since I met you a few months after Dorian. Um, I actually have just got having gone through all of this disaster, disaster recovery, in fact, just moved back into my home uh, a week ago um, after Hurricane Dorian. Um, lots of things are popping up in my head. Uh, primarily, first of all, I love the idea of community engagement. And in fact, in a small village of Ocracoke, a lot of that, uh, the actions proposed already took place just because we're so tiny, but I can imagine that in a larger town, it would be harder to have that happening. But um, specific, specifically the VOAD issues, um, you know, you have volunteers coming and they have all kinds of different skill sets. So teaching people how to muck and gut their homes that live in a community is a phenomenal idea. But my concern is, and one of the goals are, are hurdles you've probably thought of is, you can read about all of these disasters in the news, but until it hits you, mm. it's the farthest in your mind. So how do you prepare a community that isn't even willing to go there because they don't know what's coming? Um, so, and then the other thing is, I love the idea of the community being part of the disbursement of money, um, but how would you propose the, to, get the state to help you do that. I mean, what we've experienced in Hyde County in particular were um, lots of money. We don't know where it went through the county and there's not a lot of accounting. So, I mean, we've all been mostly taken care of here three years on, but there's lots of large questions. And I think some of the funds that have sort of disappeared could have really gone to climate resiliency. Um, instead, it was just this rush to put people back in a house and, and, and look good. Um, get somewhat sense of normalcy, um, but there is still no sense of normalcy. And another thing that you pointed out there that I think is super essential is that the first six weeks or so after a disaster, the Red Cross sends mental health counselors when everyone is still in shock and looking for food and trying to 
gather their wits. A year on, two years on is when the real PTSD and, and the issues come up and there is nothing and no one and the people are either indebted to SBA loans or they were too poor to uh, get one in the first place and they're just still getting back in their home. And so affording mental health counselors is off the table. And it is, in my opinion, one of the most devastating things after this, after these disasters, because without that mental health, you cannot pull together as a community if you can't, you know, be whole in yourself. And so um, I, I commend everything you're doing. And I'm just curious about what you've thought about these challenges in advance. Um, Kelly, one of the, I'll just be brief. One of the major differences in our response in North Carolina versus the response in Louisiana to Katrina is the nonprofits in Louisiana organized a major fund to fund the grassroots community organizers on the ground. And we have not done that in North Carolina. And that fund became a statewide foundation, is still operating today. They're still doing, they have a major research component, which we lack. You know, we sort of emphasize the advocacy needs, but we need major research. We know anybody that builds influence knows you have to have the data and the political power combined. So we're just lacking so much. And, you know, for many of us on the ground and, and many on this call, the, the situation has been so disastrous itself uh, that, that, you know, it's, I haven't in my 40 years of community development and system change work, I've never seen anything so dysfunctional. I'm just being honest with you. So I actually say when I lecture on this, our disaster response system in North Carolina is a disaster itself and we're not coming to grips with it. And yet the skill is to be able to acknowledge that and then work with our public and private partners without demonizing them or blaming them. You know, our grassroots communities have their own systems of dysfunction, just like our institutions do. But we just haven't really come together and provided the funding for the grassroots groups. And we haven't moved most of the responses beyond an individual client-based system. And you can't do advocacy work that way and you can't do community empowerment work that way. It's just not the way it works. So there's a lot we need to do pretty rapidly uh, over the next year or two. And hopefully, you know, we won't get hit too bad while we're trying to organize ourselves a lot better in the state. We've got, I just want to say one additional thing was that, um, I, you know, when she talked about like the resources and how do we engage with the, you know, the government and the state partners, one of the things that we are participating in and try to building our partnerships is um, we are working with the NCOR and the RISE program and, and, and their stakeholder meetings. And what it allows us to do is to share with them our vulnerabilities and our ideas of what a project may look like. And as part of the community and the sharing of these ideas, they come away with uh, five to 10 projects that they will work on and develop and provide resources for. So those are the kinds of engagements that we're doing and hoping to continue to build you know, uh, partnerships with, with people that are kind of doing the same work, but also so that we can share, you know, common shared resources. Thank you for that. I want to name a couple of things that I'm hearing. One is, you know, uh, Kelly mentioned there were a couple of challenges thinking about the model and how to capture all of these barriers that are part of the system, including long-term mental health needs. Um, and uh, see if I catch some of the other ones. That preparedness is hard to think about when we are often dealing, you know, preparedness for things that may happen is hard to deal with when we are thinking about things that are happening right now. Um, and then also this question of funding and making sure that funding doesn't just uh, sort of stop at the traditional players, but also gets really into the communities. Mac is talking about this model in Louisiana where a lot of the nonprofits were organizing around that that has become a major state foundation. Um, I wanna name, um, it, maybe take like two more minutes because I know there's some folks who had some resources they wanted to share, but you know, there are some state agencies, there are some philanthropic representatives on this call um, who may wanna respond to some of the things that they've been hearing and how, you know, um, how that is playing into future plans, including um, as Anita mentioned, uh, the RISE program um, that uh, 
has been one avenue for uh, Lumberton and Robertson County to engage with state agencies, but that's, um, that's it sounds like, Anita, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a lot of organizing work y'all have done to be able to uh, be, be good participants in the RISE program, is that right? Correct, that's correct. It's checking with some of the statewide and mainstream partners um, who um, may be thinking about this model and maybe have questions. This is, Andy, this is Sylvia from the North Carolina Pro Bono Resource Center. I'm not sure, we're not necessarily who you were referring to, but um, I, I, I know that there was a lot said about legal services. Um, and um, as, a, as an organization that often takes its cues from legal aid in terms of unmet legal needs, um, I would encourage you to continue the conversations with legal aid, but also know that you can, you know, when they, when, if they say, well, we don't handle that kind of issue or we're not, you know, able to address all of the issues, they have access to the Pro Bono Resource Center and um, the North Carolina Bar Association that we can mobilize lawyers and we did mobilize lawyers after Florence because we also had funding, um, which we don't any longer, but um, my guess is we would should a disaster, um, a, well, should a disaster arise that needed that, um, we can mobilize private attorneys. Um, so I just wanna keep, I just wanna put that out there and keep that in mind. Part of it is building those relationships in advance though, right, Sylvia? So oh, that's true. And we are partnering with Legal Aid, actually, their disaster recovery group. And like you said, when the money does come in the event that we know that another disaster hurricane will come, that we've built these relationships prior to that. And then we can, you know, engage them with the community members that we hear from where we are, that these are the needs that they're addressing. But thank you so much. But naming for the state organizations like Sylvia's and others that you know, the, the relationships have to be built in advance is what I'm hearing, that it's not, um, hey, we sent out a bunch of emails after this disaster because we got a bunch of money, but that we as Pro Bono Resource Centers, American Red Cross, as others have built those relationships and already know how to reach the organizers like Anita and Hannah and Mac and others. Tracy, and then I think I'm going to um, make sure that some connections happen afterwards because I know other people want to jump in too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yes, I'm with uh, NCOR and Community Development, and I just want to applaud the group um, in Robinson County because um, I think the organizing and getting the community active in the recovery and resiliency process can only amplify the benefits that can come from the federal and other funding sources that come to the state after a disaster. And I know that like we're working very closely with Adrian Lowry at the Housing Authority in the city of Lumberton, the Public Housing Authority there. And I don't know if you guys know Adrian, but um, he had over a thousand residents on a wait list for housing. And um, he lost four different housing developments in the combined storms. And um, we've been trying to provide funding to him so that they can rebuild some of those units and so that he can get more funding um, relief from FEMA and other sources to try to make more affordable housing available for the most vulnerable of the residents in the county. Checking in with the team from Robinson County. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. And we've been in touch with Ann, Amanda and uh, uh, we're hoping your staff and Department of Environmental Quality staff will be here on June 7th. So uh, we can be in touch with you about that. We're also working closely with our elected officials as we always have, uh, particularly our uh, indigenous and black officials. Uh, uh, and, and the black community in Lumberton's really been hit hard 
as well as the Indian community, the indigenous community in West Lumberton. So we've, we've lost a school in West Lumberton um, on a lot of businesses. And, you know, what we are starting to say is if we're not careful, this, this, is, this can be a version of rural climate gentrification if we don't really rebuild these communities and, and work harder to keep the, this property in the private sector, which helps the tax base and the city, um, then, then, and we really need the community base, as you say, Tracy, to, to meet, meet uh, our officials halfway. But again, you know, we've been pretty successful over the years with funding for grassroots work, but most of our rural counties don't have a lot of history of grassroots organizing and social justice work uh, in the East, particularly. So, and so uh, Caitlin's on the phone, on the call, and ZSR has been a big supporter of our work, uh, our largest one over 40 years here in Robinson County, in terms of grassroots support. Caitlin, you wanted to jump in, then I'm going to bring us into a close on here. Yeah, sure, and I won't take long. Um, Caitlin Burke with the Z Smith Reynolds Foundation. And we, like Max said, um, have supported the Disaster Survival and Resiliency School. And um, uh, exciting to see how the project has, has taken shape over the past two years and really commend Anita and Mac and the team. Glad to see the new faces. Um, I look forward to meeting you all soon. Um, just commend you all for, for how this has shifted and evolved as we have come out of COVID and sort of responding to the needs in the communities that you all are hearing. I think that from the foundation's perspective, from, well, okay. From my perspective within the foundation, this work, um, the resiliency work crosses so many of the priorities that the foundation has. You know, it's, it's funded through our environmental grant making, but it goes far beyond that to supporting social and economic justice, housing, health, um, racial justice, climate justice, um, all of the things, democracy. So um, I, I look forward to continuing to learn with you all about how we see this more holistically and not in a silo of, of environmental grant making. Um, thanks so much you all um, for, for bringing this conversation forward. Thank you, Andy, and thank you everybody for uh, listening to our presentation and being so supportive and providing the wonderful resources and comments. Thank you. Anita, I know Noah also wanted to connect with you uh, separately as well. And uh, let me name this, and if I'm stepping over a line as a facilitator here, I'm trying to weave in some, some things from previous conversations, but you know, what, what Mac mentioned is there are five part-time staff that are working on this. Uh, this is uh, not something that happens without financial resources to support the people doing it. Um, and, you know, the, the message I hear uh, for statewide and mainstream groups is if you want to have good success in your community engagement, um, like through the RISE program, you got to have um, a, a, an organization, a set of organizers like Anita and the team there. Um, but doing so takes resources. Let me add that. Um, Tracy, I will make sure, let me drop the PDF in here one more time, and I'll make sure that all of those slides and all of those resources get sent out. Uh, I saw a lot of head nods and appreciations in the chat already for um, the Robinson County Group, uh, Robinson County's Cooperative for Sustainable Development, but if we could give a little bit, uh, one more, either in emojis or on video for their time. Um, and making sure that we continue to disseminate these models. 